Well, in the year 1987, the world was introduced to the most annoying character ever. He was introduced to us by an illustrator named Martin Hanford uh, from Britain. This character wears round glasses, a red and white sweater, and a toque with a red pom-pom on top. And he goes by many names. In Britain, his name is Wally. It is Charlie in France, Walter in Germany, Ali in Turkey. Uh, he is uh, Willie in Norway. But in North America, his name is Waldo. Now, why is he the most annoying character ever? Because he is purportedly present on every single page and in every scene of his books. But it can be incredibly difficult to locate him. He's supposed to be there, but he seems hidden. And if you are like me, there's probably a point after four hours of looking in a stupid circus scene and not finding him where you begin to be frustrated. And you throw the book down and you wonder... Is he even there in the first place? Maybe this is a big joke. Joke to all the people who look for the person that's not there. So here's a question. Have you ever felt that way about God? Have you ever felt like, although God says God's going to be there in every scene of our lives, in every page that we enter into, that the moment comes and we look for God and we can't find him? Does God ever seem hidden to you? And in your frustration and in your disappointments, we throw our books down and we question whether God is actually there ever in the first place. Maybe this is just a big cosmic joke. We have that very scene in our reading from Exodus. It recounts the miraculous provision of water from a rock, but the main point of the reading is a declaration of God's presence and his providence for his people as they journey through the desert. So to catch you up in the story, Israel, they've left Egypt. It's that triumphal scene where Moses charges into the Egyptian pharaoh and says, let my people go. Right? And they go through the Red Sea and they walk miraculous th miraculously on dry land because God parts the waters God's presence is going with them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. We heard that in our psalm. They have just encountered the miracle of bread from heaven, of manna, where God would feed them with this miraculous bread in the morning and quail in the evening. Every step of their journey to this point has been one where God's presence and God's activity is clearly seen for the people of Israel. Right? Our reading begins, and it says, the whole Israelite community, they set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place to place, as the Lord commanded. So God's leading them. God's taken them a place. And it says, they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water to drink. And so they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water. Now, Rephidim was understood to be a wadi. So that's the point, that's why they went there. Because it was supposed to be a wadi in the desert, and it was going to be a place where Israel could get a drink of water. We all know that we can go several days without food, but only a few days without water. Water is incredibly important. So they were making this trip to this wadi for water. Yet when they arrive... It's all dried up. Without warning, the tribe of Israel enters into a place where things don't seem to be as neat and tidy as it was before. And they complain. And they grumble. And they question. Now before we start labeling the people of Israel as sniveling whiners and giving them a bad rap, we should ask, have we ever done this? 
I was thinking about when I first moved to Toronto. I was, was raised on Vancouver Island, and so Toronto, the big city, was quite frightening. So it took me about a week and a half to gather the courage to try to go on the subway. This was a huge thing. And as I walked down the steps of the subway, uh, a man in a well-dressed man in a three-piece suit screamed past me, running down the steps in order to make it to the subway train that was on the platform below. He did not, however, make it because the subway pulled away before he got to jump in. And what erupted from his mouth could only be described as grumbling and cursing, with maybe a little bit of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Even though there is going to be another train in just three minutes, the way that this person was arranging his life and putting things together and arranging his schedule, it was all disrupted at that point. And frustration and disappointment and discomfort set in. And it's easy for me to nitpick that person until I realize that I do the same thing. And things don't go my way. How do we respond when things do not happen the way we would like them to? Or the way that we would have planned them to go? We who sometimes hold too tightly the reins of ownership of our own lives. And we try to arrange everything to the way that we think it should happen. When something disrupts that, do we act like the three-piece suit man in the subway station, or like Israel in the desert. Because in that moment of not receiving what they thought they would receive in the way they thought they would receive it, they question. They complain. But what is more, they fundamentally forget the presence of God in their midst. Verse 3 says, The people... They were thirsty for water, and they grumble against Moses, and they say, why did you bring us out of Egypt? See, God's not even on the page anymore. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? To make our children and us and our livestock die of thirst? Moses gets the complaint and the ire and the frustration. God just seems to have vanished. For the people of Israel who look at things only through the lens of of their own dissatisfaction and their own frustration, the only explanation is that God has disappeared and Moses is just leading them to their deaths. Now, being disappointed, being thirsty, longing for water as they travel through the desert, it's not bad. That's not a sin. And for us, having hopes and explanations and planning for our lives, that's never wrong. But when we see our lives only through the lens of what we want to happen and how we want things to happen, we, in effect, turn our attention away from God who says, I am always there. And that's what Israel did. And in doing so, they forgot something incredibly important. Verse 1 that we described and that we heard with uh, going, the Israelites left the desert of sin and they went from place to place to place. And then there's a very important phrase, as the Lord commanded. See, God led the people of Israel to the dried up wadi. He led them there. God directed with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night the way that they progressed until they arrived at that place. Just because it didn't look the way that Israel thought it should look does not deny the fact that Israel lands in the very place that they need to be based on the guidance and the direction of God. And what is more, God's presence was still with them. God says to Moses when he gives him his instructions, and I will stand before you. God is there. But again, Israel was only looking through the lens of their frustrations and couldn't see the presence of God. Now this doesn't mean that every hiccup 
every bump, 